Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all, and thanks, uh, thank you all for uh, coming. My name is Richard Locke. I'm the provost of uh, Brown and also a professor of political science and international and public affairs, and it's really wonderful to see you here uh, and wonderful to be able to uh, host our senior senator, uh, Jack Reed. Um, but before I go into the formal introduction, I thought maybe all of us could just take a moment of silence uh, in um, to sort of think and send our thoughts and prayers uh, to, uh, to the victims of um, uh, the terrible uh, terrorist attack uh, in Paris this weekend. So maybe just uh, one moment of silence. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's times like these where we feel especially fortunate to have leadership like Senator Reeds um, in Washington and here uh, at home. Um, I'm very, very uh, pleased to be able to introduce you all, uh, to, to host you all, and to welcome you all uh, uh, this evening. Um, I serve, uh, at least for a couple more months, as both the uh, director of the Watson Institute, uh, and that's why we have the uh, uh, Watson uh, uh, banner here, as well as, uh, as the provost. And uh, we thought about having Senator Reed deliver this distinguished lecture. We considered, you know, what spaces on campus uh, would offer sort of a dignified uh, setting deserving of Senator Reed's uh, stature. Uh, and we looked at lots of places, and the Watson is actually a, a beautiful place, but the actual space for Watson wasn't large enough, we thought, uh, for uh, this occasion. And so we chose this beautiful uh, space, the John Hay, uh, the John Carter Brown Library, named, uh, f you know, sort of, that has uh, so much uh, historical and political uh, documents and maps and uh, uh, original uh, uh, documents, because rare books, because we thought that it uh, very nicely um, sort of shows the continuation um, of, uh, of global uh, perspectives. And I'm uh, very, very uh, thankful to my friend and colleague, uh, Neil Safir, who's the director of the John uh, Carter Brown Library for hosting us uh, today. So I don't know if, if Neil is here, but uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, and, uh, and let me just uh, get to the point and uh, introduce uh, Senator Reed this afternoon. Um, as you know, on, on Friday morning, uh, uh, I had a very uh, different introduction planned. Uh, this was an invitation that we had sent out months ago, uh, and I was going to regale you with all sorts of descriptions and anecdotes of the things you al already know about uh, our senior senator, his commitment to our state and our nation, his military service and well-earned honors, the respect he has garnered among Rhode Island vi voters, but also his peers in Congress. Uh, but the devastating attacks uh, that took place on Friday in Paris uh, have uh, forced me to rethink this. Now, we invited Senator Reid to give this lecture because of his distinguished uh, record of service and a truly global worldview. At Watson uh, and here at Brown, we seek to contribute to building a more just and peaceful world through our teaching, our research, and service. And doing this requires welcoming and hearing from policymakers and practitioners like Senator Reed, who every day are grappling with very real ways and, uh, and with forces that work against peace and justice, the forces of terrorism, authoritarianism, religious and ethnic strife, and inadequate access to education, food, and health care. And we could not have predicted in March when we extended this invitation to Senator Reed that on the very weekend of his talk, we would be reminded of the significant and destabilizing threats and dangers that exist in our world today. Now, while it may take many weeks and months to fully understand what transpired in Paris on Friday, the horrific bombings and loss of life serve as an unwanted reminder that ensuring national and international security is growing and increasingly challenging. And this is absolutely essential to everything else we want to do, development, citizenship, um, uh, high quality education and health. We need to have a basis of strong uh, security. And while global leaders consider the short and long-term responses to the full range of factors that confront us, 
like addressing domestic and foreign terrorism, serving the needs of refugees fleeing war-torn regions like Syria and Iraq, and developing strategies to create a lasting peace in the Middle East and elsewhere, it is encouraging to know that we have among our leaders a person of Senator, uh, Senator Reid's standing, intelligence, judgment, and integrity. During his more than two decades in the Senate, Senator Reid has distinguished himself as a thoughtful and courageous leader on matters of domestic affairs as well as foreign policy. He is the all too rare breed of a politician who is driven by his conscience, by his principle, by his values, uh, and is willing to work across party lines for the good of the nation. You can read a brief biography in your programs uh, which enumerates his important committee assignments and personal story, but I did want to share with you what others have said about uh, Senator Reid, and just really quickly, uh, two anecdotes. Uh, according to Time Magazine, uh, Time basically wrote, Reid is a serious, intellectually honest veteran and an expert on defense issues in the Senate. And the New York Times describes him as a quiet deal maker, respected by colleagues in both parties. We are so pleased to have Senator Reid with us today to offer his all too timely thoughts about the challenges of a turbulent world. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rick, for that very kind and gracious introduction. And uh, it is indeed an honor to be here at the Watson Institute and Brown University. The Brown and the Watson Institute are intellectual forces that have a worldwide impact. And I'm just delighted to be able to speak to this group this evening. I, I see many friends in the audience. And thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, as Rick said, this is a slightly different mood than we anticipated last uh, Friday, and frankly, a slightly different mood than I was anticipating as I drafted Ryan's remarks over the last several weeks. But I hope uh, my comments are, are responsive to the moment as well as to the long term. Um, we meet this evening uh, in the shadow of the carnage and chaos of Paris, and our hearts go out to the French people, and we are committed to stand with them as together we face the global threat of terrorist attacks and other challenges to democratic societies. The heinous violence in Paris reminds us that we live in a world of great challenges that cannot be ignored. These acts should also prompt us to attempt a keener understanding of the complexity of these challenges, the need for effective responses, and the appreciation that in this interconnected world, action engenders reaction with increasing speed. Before the events of Paris, I wanted to discuss two general themes as a way to help guide the analysis of a dangerous and complex world. And I think these themes are still relevant today. The first is a discussion about the nature of the global political dynamic we currently face. And I would call it order versus disorder and we saw some of that disorder last Friday. And the second deals with how we interpret and respond to the world, and I would call that culture and capacity. Looking back, uh, the past is reassuring because we've survived it. And as it recedes, tumult ebbs, and a picture of progress or at least stability emerges. This seems particularly the case for one like myself who was born in the warm afterglow of unconditional victory over fascism, lived through the increasingly prosperous post-war post years, and witnessed the Cold War end with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Of course, this view obscures much. The perilous days and years after Pearl Harbor when victory over fascism, and indeed the survival of democracy, was not certain. The nuclear arms race that came close to apocalypse with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the agony of Vietnam, and many other confrontations and conflicts that dominate our attention. Nevertheless, there was a symmetry to the world then that is not so apparent today. After World War II, it was a bipolar world with two major and divergent political and economic systems, the United States and its principally Western allies versus the Soviet Union and its satellites. 
Both superpowers were armed with nuclear weapons and both understood the catastrophic consequences of miscalculation. The nation state was still the central organizing principle. Although the end of World War II ushered in the United Nations and the beginning of multinational economic and social organizations, national identity remained strong. Arab nationalism was the rallying cry of Nasser in the 1950s, not sectarian jihad. There was another aspect of the confrontation between the Soviets and the West that in retrospect, I think made it more manageable. Communism was about creating a workers' paradise in this world, but the Soviets failed as central planners while capitalist markets in the West flourished. And the palpable failure to deliver basic economic security eventually collapsed the Soviet system more decisively than any military campaign. Today, in contrast, one of our major challenges is presented by violent extremists who do not expect the reward in this world. As they can gain control of space, they will have to govern and this will put pressure on their monomaniacal aims as it did on the Taliban in Afghanistan, but it is unlikely to significantly or quickly change their disruptive behaviors that contribute to the foreboding sense of disorder that is growing in the world. And today there are fundamental forces and longer term forces that have shaped and are continuing to shape our world, not just the incidents that we read about. And chief among them is this phenomenon of globalization. Now it's a term that embraces many dimensions and thus it's become a, a catchphrase for many different forces at work. But it's useful to acknowledge what we all implicitly know, technology, transportation, trade, governmental structures, and other factors have brought us all closer together with both great benefits and great liabilities. As a positive force, globalization has contributed to a steady reduction in poverty in developing countries. But it has also been blamed for draining jobs and capital from developed countries to lower cost areas of production. Much of our current domestic debate involves a response to changed economic circumstances of the middle class. And this domestic debate not only focuses our attention, but affects the resources that are willing to give to international issues. Moreover, this factor adds this sense of anxiety and uncertainty that feeds this perception of disorder. It's a lot different having been a child of the 50s when every year you expected to get a little bit better in your paycheck than to be a child of today when your parents are looking at, in real terms, decreasing wages each year. But among these disruptive forces that are lumped together, one of the most powerful is technological innovation, technology. And the best description of the effect of new path-breaking technology that I've ever heard is a phrase from a university president uttered more than a decade ago. And in his words, and I, I'm afraid I don't recall his name, this type of technology, it makes good things better and bad things worse. Information technology has helped erase boundaries and circumvent traditional hierarchies and especially through social media, create cyber communities that can and do challenge traditional institutions and injustices. The stories of the Arab Spring and Maidan Square demonstrate the ability of social networks to, to coalesce around issues and mobilize for action. In the past, without this technology, it was much harder to communicate with and locate like-minded individuals and much, much harder in non-democratic societies to mobilize for action. These outpourings of democratic yearnings have unfortunately counterparts on the worst and other side of the ledger. And ISIL is a prime example of a fanatical group of terrorists who use social networks to great effect. They are able to attract recruits and conduct sophisticated information campaigns to outrage and discourage target audiences, while at the same time undermining and intimidating legitimate governments. So both Democratic activism through social media and encouraging development and terrorist information campaigns, a serious threat, are contributing to this sense of disorder. And now, we all recognize significant technological change has happened before. 
The Industrial Revolution was disruptive and likely as perplexing to many then as the Information Revolution seems to us today. In fact, I suspect that gentleman was very perplexed uh, when confronted with some of the Industrial Revolution. But I would suggest that there may be at least two important differences that make our challenges particularly acute. First, the speed of change is extraordinary, making adaptation, particularly by governments, very difficult. And second, although a great deal of information technology had its roots in government through both defense and non-defense research, private research and innovation are leaving government far behind and very quickly behind. And moreover, in the past with life-changing technology like television, there was a role for government, a very distinct role, in regulation. The FCC awarded licenses, controlled content. Up until fairly recently, there was a fairness doctrine where if you said something about one person, you had to say something else about the other person at the same time. Uh, and it was a passive technology, radio and television. Uh, today, the internet is not only interactive, you can go back and forth, it is free of most constraints and regulations. And I saw a very interesting story in the New York Times on September 19th about the power of information technology. A small band of Syrian refugees in and around Erdogan, Turkey, using the very vivid image of Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old Syrian child who drowned at sea, began organizing a Facebook campaign to persuade the Turkish authorities to allow them to leave by land. Now this face group, Facebook group generated an expanded number of participants that helped organize their efforts, discussing travel tips, updating police deployments so that people could avoid the police, assigning specific tasks to people with specific skills to get them through, something that couldn't be done very easily before. But in a very, very revealing comment, a young man, Jad al Mus il Mani, 22, a Syrian, a father of three, said he had been reluctant to attempt to track to Europe until he saw the Facebook campaign. In a real sense, the Facebook effort not only provided operational assistance, it transformed the goals of the precipitants from survival in a conflicted Turkey to arrival in a more stable Europe. So you have this technology that is doing all of these things, not just making it easy to find your way, but actually getting you on your way. And of course, these technological changes have profound rep repercussions in military affairs. We now have a new dimension of military activity, cyber, to complement land, sea, air, and space. And the Russian operations in the Crimea offer a glimpse into this added dimension of cyber warfare. The initial phase of the Russian operations focused on jamming and rendering inoperable Ukrainian communications. And due to superior equipment, organization, and training, the Russians enjoyed stunning success. Ukrainian units were unable to communicate with higher headquarters. Higher headquarters were unable to communicate with subordinates. In effect, the Russians electronically isolated the Ukrainian units and then took them down. That's one of the first things you learn in tactics. If you can isolate a unit, and then you can go attack them, you'll likely be successful. Of course, their attack was led by the Little Green Men, the international terminology for Russian Special Operations Forces in disguise claiming to be Crimean separatists. But this marriage of unconventional ground forces and electronic technology was stunning. Now, our military, we must make a transition from an era of information dominance on the battlefield, undergirded by secure and virtually ininterruptible electronic transmissions and communications, to an era when communication and coordination are difficult and at times impossible. This aspect will affect the way we structure, train, and equip our forces. And a sign of this might be the reinstitution of celestial navigation as a course at the Naval Academy. Um, for a generation, we assumed that the precision and reliability of our satellite-based GPS systems and other electronic platforms had condemned the sextant to the same fate as the slide rule. How many people have used the slide rule here? Okay. Okay. 
well, we're at least rethinking the sextant. And this has a profound ramification of the way we fight and the way we have to prepare to fight in the future. And our military posture and our military status is inextricably linked with our intelligence and counterintelligence activities. And here, cyber challenges make headlines every day. Chinese hackers penetrate the Office of Personnel Management. The North Koreans break into Sony. The personnel communications of the CIA director are compromised. We are just beginning to take tentative steps to deal with cyber espionage, directed at our commercial as well as our governmental activities. And we have, at this point, few of any international rules of the road, unlike many other areas of international interaction. We have to make key decisions about not only defensive operations, but we have to think for the first time about offensive operations. What's our doctrine? What's our procedure? And of all of this, of course, we have to consider privacy. These are daunting tasks, and the clock is ticking faster in the information age than it seemed to tick in the industrial age. And there's another long-term forces. There are several, but I'll mention one of them. That is disruptive and growing in effect, and that force is climate change. No one should be surprised that I'm mentioning climate change. Uh, it seems that everyone has an opinion on climate change. National security experts have for many years been pointing to the perils of climate change. Seawater rise, for example, puts excruciating economic and social pressure on poor coastal countries. And some even have speculated that one of the factors contributing to the civil war in Syria was a four-year drought that undermined the regime's ability to placate unrest with at least a fairly stable economy. For me, one of the most revealing comments on climate change came a few years ago at a hearing where a naval admiral routinely mentioned that the Arctic Ocean would be open for navigation several months of the year, beginning, in his view, in approximately 2020. Now, and I don't think I'm alone in this room, I had been brought up knowing that except for an atomic submarine poking through the ice cap, the Arctic would always be non-navigable and would never require a naval presence. Well, all of that has changed. Raising a host of international trade, environmental, economic, and military issues, such as the Navy's need to acquire polar-class icebreakers, we don't have any in our Navy, and they don't come cheap. Now, these are some, but certainly not all, of the long-term forces that are disrupting the international economic and security arrangements that seemed just a few years ago to be so durable, and that at the moment seem to be shifting from order into disorder. But we are not mere captives of these forces. The decisions that we make and that others make in collaboration with us or in opposition to us shape the direction and impact of these forces. However, in my view, it too often goes unnoted and unappreciated that these decisions are rooted in cultural assumptions not only about others, but about ourselves. And the implementation of these decisions rests on our capacities, and in this complicated world, the capacities of others. Now, by culture, I'm using a very, very informal term that tries to encompass the amalgam of history and language, tradition, and myth that helps define people. And by capacity, I'm also using a very informal term that references the institutional and political capabilities of individuals and institutions. And let me be clear, these are far from scientific models that purport to describe or predict. And rather, at best, they simply may be a shorthand for an accumulation of evidence and experience that helps us to understand and act. And given the passage of time, in, in my view, I think the juxtaposition of the conduct of Operation Desert Storm under President George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41, and Operation Iraqi Freedom under President George W. Bush, Bush 43, illustrates, again, an example of the interplay between culture and capacity. And I will readily admit that many of my observations tonight rest on the basis of hindsight, not foresight. In Desert Storm, Bush 41 and his advisors, principally James Baker and Brent Scowcroft, were responding to a gross violation of international law, the invasion of Kuwait, which threatened international norms and longtime allies, as well as threatening economic stability throughout the world. 
They responded to the Iraq invasion with a rapid deployment of American forces to contain the aggression by assembling a robust international coalition and by gaining the formal support of the United Nations. After assembling this overwhelming military force, they conducted military operations with the limited objectives of ejecting Iraqi forces from Kuwait, reestablishing Kuwaiti sovereignty, and limiting the power but not replacing Hussein, his regime in Baghdad. These actions were consistent with a very strong precedence in American foreign policy, especially during and after World War II, of assembling and leading internationally recognized coalitions to resist and repel threats to the sovereignty of other nations, threats that could disrupt the international order and implicate the vital interests of the United States and its allies. So in an important sense, these actions fit within our, our political culture and our political range of operations. And these actions also demonstrated a very sophisticated view of our capacities. Bush 41 and his advisors were aware of the conventional military superiority of our forces. Dominance of the air, the availability of long-range precision weapons on land, sea, and air, the professionalism and skill of our forces all contributed to a stunning and rapid victory. But they were also aware of the difficulties and cost of governing Iraq. And here our capacities were not as robust and the difficulties were more complex. And the course of action of President Bush 41 successfully, in my view, balanced this understanding of our culture and capacity as well as understanding Iraqi culture and capacity. Moving forward in the wake of 9-11, President George W. Bush first rallied the nation and the world, conducting a brilliant operation in Afghanistan to remove the Taliban who had sponsored bin Laden and al-Qaeda while they planned their attack on America. And the combination, again, of sophisticated airstrikes together with American-assisted Afghan forces on the ground routed the Taliban. But before the dust had settled in Afghanistan, Bush 43 and his administration turned their attention to Iraq. Here, unlike Desert Storm, they lacked an obvious and overt act by Saddam Hussein as a predicate for our action. Instead, they made Iraq part of the world war on terror with particular emphasis on the nuclear aspirations of Iraq. Moreover, they began to talk not strictly in terms of defending America and ensuring stability among nations, but defeating terrorism by advancing democracy throughout the world, beginning with Iraq. In November 2003, and after the invasion of Iraq, President George W. Bush made it clear what was motivating him. In his words, 60 years of Western nations excusing and accommodating the lack of freedom in the Middle East did nothing to make us safe, because in the long run, stability cannot be purchased at the expense of liberty. Invoking freedom, liberty, and democracy resonated with the American people. But our culture of democracy, inherited in great part from Britain and developed through trial and turmoil over many decades, could not be easily and immediately implanted on the Iraqi culture. Our view of democracy recognized the need for rights, particularly minority rights. Iraqi politics had been for a long period of time and seemed to continue to be winner take all. And although there was a sense of Iraqi nationhood, sectarian divisions are more dominant there than here and they dramatically influence political outcomes. This cultural dissonance was amplified by a lack of capacity. After another stunning and swift conventional military victory, the Bush administration was unprepared for the arduous task of rebuilding and governing a complicated and shell-shocked nation. They exacerbated the situation by the wholesale dismissal of Iraqi government workers through the country, throughout the country under their depacification program. Lack in sufficiently prepared United States government personnel to carry out civilian functions and mentor Iraqis they hired private contractors with often unsatisfactory results. And this impression of chaos in Iraq still permeates the American public. Even though President Bush and his administration did significantly improve the security situation over time. Political and sectarian disputes still hobble the government in Iraq. And with the rise of ISIL and the growing influence of the Iranians, Iraq is once again a battleground. Now, history will sort out all the twists and turns, but at this point, our experience in Iraq underscores the need in, to understand the cultural forces which prompt us 
and the often differing forces of those we seek to help or hinder. And in every case, we must be sure we have the capacities to meet our aspirations. So how should we respond to these disruptive forces that propel change with increasing momentum? As I have suggested, our set of options for responding to these changes are shaped by what I've called our culture and capacity, and let me try to discuss each briefly in turn. Our present political culture has been increasingly dominated by a growing course of deriding big government and echoing the no tax sentiment that has been a litmus test of so many campaigns. And these reforms, these refrains rather, strike a chord with many and have antecedents throughout our history and culture. New England town meetings, small and personal, has long been held up as an exemplar of American democracy. Small town America in general, demonstrating authentic American values, has been a staple of our culture. And today, with the rise of social media, increasing numbers of people can bypass the media establishment and operate in a virtual space that reinforces their own views and opinions. And this, too, reinforces this notion of government is bad and other so approaches are appropriate. In addition, today's political culture has tapped into the isolationist strain in America, which dates back to the earliest days of our republic. And again, after the large-scale military interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, the American people are understandably wary of U.S. adventures abroad. And this weariness is reflected in the foreign policy of President Obama. And certainly the gridlock in Washington, partisan feuding feel this antipathy towards government, so we cannot excuse ourselves. Now, while these sentiments may reflect recurring impulses in our country, and they've come and they've gone, they've ebbed and they've flowed, the consequence is that our political culture is creating impediments to our ability to respond to the global forces that are shaping our lives. In today, particularly, our political culture is severely limiting our capacity to anticipate or respond to current and emerging challenges. We and our European allies face military challenges from Russia, demanding a rewrite of the end of the Cold War. Yet under budget pressures, both the United States and the Europeans are significantly scaling back troops stationed in the NATO area, and we've closed dozens of bases to generate savings. China has taken provocative action in the South China Sea through the construction of islands to bolster claims to territorial rights. We've responded by asserting our maritime rights, but this dispute, and the fact that U.S. business interests tie our future even more close to the Pacific presages an increasingly complicated challenge there. The Iranians continue to seek regional hegemony in the Middle East, even as they begin the first steps to comply with the international agreement to restrain their nuclear program. The North Koreans continue to act provocatively, especially in the cyber dimension, and they are enhancing their air power and their nuclear capability. And after last Friday, I don't have to we emphasize the fact that there are non-nation state challenges. The global security environment is further complicated by terrorist activities, which have claimed large swaths of territory, which continue to incubate and try to carry out attacks even here at home, and apparently was successful in either encouraging or directing an attack in Paris. These current challenges place demands on the military and adds the persistent need to modernize our forces to maintain a decisive advantage well into the future. Maintaining our technological advantage is expensive and will be increasingly challenging. But other than the current trajectory, these demands for military capacity are not matched by a long-term budget and the resources to meet them. Despite temporary relief, the congressional impasse over sequestration continues to impose mindless cuts in our military, which have meant significant reductions in our force size and in training, which in turn reduces readiness and lowers troop morale. As such, we will have to examine ways to use our limited capacity more pragmatically. This includes increasingly working in coalition with our allies and partners and building interoperability with the U.S. role focused on providing key enablers like logistics, intelligence, and targeting support that other nations may lack. It also includes developing our special operations force to work by, through, and with foreign security forces to build their capacity to provide security in ungoverned or undergoverned spaces that might otherwise provide a safe haven for terrorists. 
And we also have to consider reforms to the military that may free up re resources within today's budget so we can apply them to training, to operations, and to re-equipping our forces. And I must emphasize that looking simply to fill the military dimension does not provide the capacity we need to meet the challenges ahead. Without adequate funding for diplomacy, for homeland protection, for a host of programs that are outside the purview of the Department of Defense, we cannot ensure the security of the United States. But just as importantly, we cannot face the underlying disruptive forces like technology and climate change if we neglected investment in education and research and sound energy policies and infrastructure, just to name a few. This is all part of our national security and national challenge. As I said at the outset, we do face significant challenges. And at times they may seem overwhelming or in cases so remote that Americans are disengaged. And while the temptation may be to just simply isolate ourselves from the world problems, in today's interconnected world, the United States does not have the option of disengaging. Instead, the current challenges demand that we remain engaged in a globalized world. And this will require that we have the hard conversation about aligning our present culture with our need for capacity as we currently try to do more thoroughly and more thoroughly understand our culture and the capacities of our allies and our antagonists. Now, in many ways, we are the best prepared nation in the world to respond to the challenges ahead. We have a tradition of innovation and invention. We have a diverse population, rich in talent. We have abundant natural resources. The great test then is to summon the political will to come together, to draw on these strengths, to build the capacity we need to face the disruptive and threatening world. And when we do so, we'll be following the example of generations of Americans who have preceded us. And as we face these stoning challenges, we are reminded that we are not the first generation of Americans that have been tested by domestic and international crises. In 1940, the Great Depression was not an historical episode. It was a lingering, lingering reality for most Americans, with France collapsing, Hitler and the Nazis controlling Europe, including Paris. Only an embattled Britain stood between them. In the Far East, the Japanese Empire was on the march, and at this perilous moment, Walter Lippmann, who studied up the road at Harvard, gave a speech to his alma mater. It was actually his 30th anniversary from his graduation. And he said the words which I think are prescient and important today. You took the good times for granted. Now you must earn them again. For every right that you cherish, you have a duty which you must fulfill. For every hope that you entertain, you have a task that you must perform. For every good that you wish to preserve, you will have to sacrifice your comfort and your ease. There is nothing for nothing any longer. Now the young graduates of 1940 from Brown and Harvard and other places went forth. Many would not return. But their courage and their unselfish commitment to the common effort in a noble cause brought us not only victory, but a chance to build a more perfect union, a more decent America, and a more peaceful world. It is in our moment now. And with the example of those came before us, and with the unique capacity of this generation's ability to use technology to connect, challenge old assumptions, and think differently, I am confident we will once again rise to the occasion. And I thank you tonight for the chance to be here. Thank you. I'd love to take questions after I apologize for be talking too long. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, let's try to get, because uh, you're talking at somebody that has two hearing aids, not just one. <laughs>
Hello. So you recently stated that you know we should show our solidarity with <coughs> the country of France because of the terrorism that happened. And as someone who, um, my church in New Jersey, 13 people died on 9-11, so I'm well aware of the effects of tragedy from terrorism. <coughs> so I guess the question is, is how can you state that a continuing occupation in Afghanistan and Iraq is going to make anybody safer? We know the United States did. This, this is simply blowback from the 1980s occupation of Afghanistan when we backed the Mujahideen in the 80s. And then suddenly, when the United States came to war, they didn't back the, United, the Mujahideen anymore. They created Osama bin Laden, and then they wanted to destroy them. So how is the blowback going to continue with the further occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq. How does it make us safer? Like the brown students on campus aren't safer by continued occupied presence of law enforcement. Right. Just like the people of Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, <coughs> and every other occupied question. All right, thanks. So how can you, yeah. in any way, as a Christian, state that we should go over to the Middle East and kill more people and create more terrorists? Well, first of all, with respect to Afghanistan, uh, the government of Afghanistan, and I did travel there about 16 times, the people of Afghanistan, by and large, want us to be there. I know the government does. So we're there not as occupiers. We're there to help the government of Afghanistan survive attacks against their structure by the Taliban, who's ruled before. And they ruled with uh, a degree of savagery that's uh, being emulated in other parts of the world right now, Iceland in particular. Our presence there is not designed to, frankly, I think everyone would like to see our forces come home tomorrow. But we don't want to leave a, a situation where this government, which is freely elected, President Ghani and the co-executive Abdullah Abdullah, freely elected, in which rights have been established that didn't exist before, particularly with respect to the role of women in their society, all of those would be jeopardized if we, I think, pulled out precipitously. It's not an occupation. It's, it's what we've done for a long time. I would draw a rough analogy, perhaps, to what we did in, in the wake of the, our victory in Europe in World War II. We were in Europe with up to three million people, three million soldiers, for years and years and years to, to frustrate Soviet aggression, but also to allow them to begin to build their societies to the strong, vibrant democracies, they've done that. Afghanistan is going to be a very challenging case. Again, it, it, it is a, a different culture, in many, and, and we have to recognize that. The other thing we have to recognize, too, is that this is not just about the stability of the, the government of Afghanistan and training their military forces. Um, we still have a, a significant counterterrorism presence there because there are forces, not only in Afghanistan, but across the border in Pakistan, that are prepared, if they have the operating space, to do what bin Laden did in the late 90s and early 2000s, organize attacks that would be directed globally against ourselves and our allies. So there is uh, many factors that compel our presence there. We have reduced our presence significantly. We're going down to about 10,000. Uh, they will be there, again, at the request of the government of Afghanistan to provide the stability that that government needs. And I think our goal and our objectives is pretty clear. We would like there to be a day in which their forces are so capable and the terrorist threats in the region have so diminished that we maintain a very small presence essentially located around the, um, the embassy. In Iraq, we did, in fact, uh, withdraw our forces. In 2008, President George W. Bush signed an agreement to pull all forces out of Iraq by 2011. We did that. We, there was negotiations to extend them to provide stability. And for many reasons, they didn't come to fruition. Uh, and now, in the face of ISIL, we again, at the request of the government of Iraq, provided resources to help train their forces and conduct counterterrorism operations. So far from an occupation, um, this is really a, a task that is in the interest of the governments that asked us to come in, 
and also in our interest in terms of preventing the type of attack that we saw in 9-11 here and that we just witnessed in Paris just last Friday. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, how does the current crisis uh, throughout the world affect the refugee crisis? Uh, well, the situation in Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan, because of the violence that we're trying to assist local governments, at least in Iraq and, and, and um, Afghanistan, to suppress, has caused a huge sort of move shift you know, unprecedented movement into Europe particularly. Uh, that would likely accelerate as the violence continues, particularly in Syria and Iraq. That puts tremendous stress on our European allies. It also invites a potential political backlash because of the f of people coming into a country. You know, I, it's, it's human nature, I'm afraid, that, you know, when, you know, you have a neighborhood and suddenly the neighborhood changes rapidly, there's a sense of what's wrong. That's happening. Um, it's also just resources. We're talking about in order to be able to respond to the new Russian adventurism bulking up NATO, well, our European allies, most of them are still trying to get to the 2% of GDP that is required. Um, their agreement to do so. One, one of the ironies is that one of the few countries that has 2% of the GDP devoted to um, their military is Greece. And that is, and that is principally because of their support of their personnel course rather than their military capabilities. So it's gonna have a huge, huge, huge impact. And that requires, one, we have to work together to try to assist them in what they're doing. And two, it leads us back to trying to find a resolution, even temporary, of the situation in Syria. This weekend, the foreign minister, Secretary Kerry, met in Vienna, trying to hammer out some type of uh, political solution to move Assad out and to allow for ceasefires. That is a very difficult challenge. Today, the president is in Turkey with the G20. I think at the top of their agenda are these issues of not only terrorism, but the pressures on the world generated by this huge refugee flow. And let me, one other final point about this refugee flow. You know, looking ahead, we are working for a day in which stability returns to these countries. But if all their human capital has departed, it's going to be very difficult to find the kind of soft power, people skills, human capital you need to, to not only rebuild but to, to prosper. Um, and so that's another one of these, if you step back, long-term effects of the current violence. Uh, we, to a degree, we saw that in Afghanistan. After our swift victory in 2001, 2002, there was a significant influx of expatriates. They're sort of drifting away. And then we're beginning to see now um, Afghanis uh, move through the refugee corridors and into Europe and other places. And again, most of them are the people with the real talent and the real expertise because they see a better future elsewhere and they need to be in their homeland. Rip. Uh, Senator Reid, thank you very much for that really terrific uh, lecture. It's really, really fantastic. Um, listening to the sort of array of different challenges that we face, uh, insecurity, but also related fields like economic development, the budget, et cetera. What, what role can universities play? You know, here we are, hubs of human capital. We try to do innovation, et cetera. How can, how can universities help uh, uh, address some of these challenges? Well, I think uh, th they have to play a critical role. And um, one is to, to take these, to try to understand much more acutely than I do, the interaction of these forces, uh, both the good and the bad, and that's really where we are today, ladies and gentlemen. There's the, 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 the worst case and, 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 and the best case. And try to uh, give us the advice to move forward in, in a way in which we can sort of understand and, and, and act appropriately given all these different confusing forces. 
Uh, that's been the, the mission of universities and colleges for a long time, trying to give us the way forward, sort of understand, which we don't understand. And I think, too, here, particularly suited to, to, to talk in terms of understand rather than just talk, because we, in Washington, we talk a lot. Understanding may be different. But, you know, this whole issue of, of culture, bureaucratic culture, institutional cultures, foreign cultures, if we're going into some place, how, how, what is the best way to, 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 to uh, pull together the local political forces, which we might not even recognize who's in charge? So those, that intellectual uh, insights would be very useful. And, and then on the technological side, and uh, you know, for example, we need a coherent national energy policy, and there are many pieces to it. But one piece is going to have to come out of the laboratory, and that's batteries that are really cheap, inexpensive, and useful. Because if we can develop battery technology, for example, then alternative energy sources, sun, solar, et cetera, become that much more easy to propagate throughout the country, because not only can you generate <coughs> the power, you can store it and use it. So, it, you know, it, I, if you step back for a second and look at this complicated world, particularly the you know, they, uh, when you look at the Russians, can you imagine how more complicated it would be if oil was $100 a barrel, not 45 How much more threatening it would be? So, you know, we, we might be just fortunate, uh, but thank goodness for a lucky break. But we have to this work so that we can keep that kind of, those resources away from people who want, want to be disruptive. Yes, sir. Is there any way to have them go toward Saudi Arabia and the Emirates? Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the Saudis and the Emirates have been very reluctant. They have they, they've taken no, uh, to my knowledge, or minimal, I mean, just be careful, minimal refugees. And I think there the issue is that they are quite concerned about their stability, to be honest. Uh, there's a, 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 you've seen terrorist incidents in uh, these places. You've seen, I'm sure they are constantly being, you know, uh, probed by ISIL and others there. And there is a, just a, a, a reluctance. They have the resources although even they at $45 a barrel are beginning to borrow mm -hmm. from their treasuries and borrow from their rainy day funds, et cetera. But there's a reluctance, and I think it's because they, they just are very wary about introducing new populations in their country. And um, they have to step up more. And um, it might not be directly, in frankly, in, in taking refugees, but in funding refugee camps. One country that has really stepped up, and it's probably because the crown prince is a brown graduate, is Jordan. Jo no, it's, not, it's, it's more than coincidental. The crown prince came by about two weeks ago, and, uh, and we had a long chat. Uh, and uh, they have a huge population of refugees on their border. They are, with, the, with international assistance, they are providing shelter and support in many of the schools, they have, the conference was telling me, they have two sessions, one for long-term uh, Jordanians and then Syrian children in the afternoon because of dif different capabilities, but huge pressure on Jordan. So they're stepping up. We have to do much, much more. But I, I must say, honestly, my sense right now is there's not an appetite among the Saudis and the Emirates to, to take in different populations because they're very nervous about their, their own internal politics and, and security. Bernie. Uh, this morning's talk shows are talking mostly about Islam, so we've been hearing about that for quite a while. Where do you think the Congress? Uh -huh. where, where, where do you think Congress is today on uh, boots on the ground in Syria? I think there's, uh, I think there's a need for boots on the ground, and the question I think still is whose boots. Uh, and I think the presumption today is that if we can get indigenous forces on the ground, that's a much better solution, not just because it pr protects our forces, but that's a better solution in the long run. We have had success operating with Kurdish forces because of many factors. They are really good fighters. 
They've been semi-autonomous since the early 90s. They, I'm talking about in, in Iraq. And they have operated on the edge of Kurdistan, and they've taken territory which is very close. In fact, many people in Baghdad think they have designs on it for the long term. But they just, uh, with American air power, took back Sinjar, which was a contested city, critical juncture, road juncture, so that that helps us in our overall strategy. Similarly, within uh, Syria, Kurdish Syrian forces have been very effective against ISIL. So there's a combination of you know, boots on the ground, indigenous boots, and air power and other technical means that we have that are very, very potent and effective. That's the approach, I think, that, that our people are talking about. Um, training, equipping, advising. Uh, the debate now, and, and this is questions that have come up publicly and before the Armed Service Committee, uh, is that it, what would our commanders recommend to the president? And uh, I think General Dempsey and others have said that if the circumstances were appropriate, they would recommend moving advisors down to the brigade level in Iraq, for example, so that they could coordinate better fires. But the, there is no one, I think, talking right now about uh, putting American combat forces, you know, e E1 through O10 on the ground. Um, yes, sir. There's a mic someplace. Yeah. Senator Reid, thank you so much for not only what you said today, but for your general service. Uh, especially appreciated what you had to say about Putin and the role he's playing in the world today. Uh, what are the implications of Putin's more aggressive role in Syria for Ukraine, and especially the sovereignty and security yeah. of, the, of our ally there. Yeah, I was in the Ukraine in uh, August, September, just the end of August, beginning of September. Um, to me, that is the critical uh, area of contest between uh, Putin and the rest of the world, frankly. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, are very, in my view, admirable. They fought very toughly against uh, the Russians. They, and their tenacity slowed down the progress and made it costly to the Russians, and so they switched gears. And up until today, because as you might have seen, there were several casualties the last few days, so it's heating up. But over the last few months, it was quiet as Putin shifted his approach from military pressure to political destabilization through surrogates in uh, Kiev and other places. And he is trying to pull back Ukraine into his orbit. Uh, and in fact, I think his, his actions were really came as a uh, response to the midnight escape of the former president of the Ukraine. I think the Russians were absolutely, you know, shocked when the, the former president fled under the pressure of the social protest. Um, and they now want either to push further into the Ukraine physically or to get a government back in Kiev that is very sympathetic to them, basically their proxy. And they're not going to give up on that. But it calls for a strengthening of the NATO alliance. It calls for, which we've done, set up command posts, uh, along in other parts of the country, cl much closer to Russia. Uh, it call, it would show a force. We have a, again, this is an, a function of our small army. Uh, we have uh, much smaller forces there today. And so we have sent as a show of force one company of paratroopers into the Baltics, into, et cetera. But I know they're paratroopers and they're down on tough people, but. 150 American paratroopers, is, is the, that is more of a tripwire than anything else. But we have to do more of that, coordinate, plan, streamline NATO's procedures, and we're doing that, but it's gonna take the resources we need. But I think that the, the, the critical point is if, and with our help they will, if the Ukrainians can, can maintain their autonomy and their, and their relationship to Europe through the EU, then that will be a significant break on Putin's aspirations. I think the situation in, in Syria was again another one where he was, he thought that the regime would fall. 
and he had to get in there, and he's in there now. Now I hope what is happening in this discussion and dialogue, they recognize as we do, that Assad's departure will help us, help everyone against ISIL, and that ISIL is really the threat. Again, the, the suggestions, more than suggestions, that they were involved in the destruction of the Russian aircraft should give Putin some added sort of uh, uh, motivation to help us cooperate. One last question, I'm telling. Let me take a, let me take two, I'll be brief. I'm always short. I'll take two quick ones, Rick. Uh, yeah. good, good evening, Senator. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned the rising threat of uh, cybersecurity on our national sovereignty. And uh, my question is uh, revolves around your recent yes vote on the SISA bill, the okay. Cyber Information Security Act. Uh, given the apparent lack of protections for personal information um, for the, your average U.S. citizen, can you please uh, take a minute and justify your sure. yes vote on that? Yeah, no, it's a very difficult vote. Uh, first of all, uh, there were a series of amendments which I hoped had passed, which I supported, which would have put more emphasis on it. And we're in the process now, too, of conferencing with the House, and hopefully we can get some of this language in. Uh, the information uh, that is, is given by a company has to, under the bill, be stripped as best as possible of personal identifying information, which is critical. All we would ideally like to see would be enough information so that it could, a threat could be shared with other uh, entities. Uh, the portal is the Department of Homeland Security, so we don't get in the problem with the Department of Defense sort of and NSA being the ones that are running everything. I think that is a, a check on uh, the issues of privacy. Uh, the system is entirely voluntary. No company has to join. And I think companies, uh, enterprises, uh, are very, very conscious. You can see the apples of the world, and everybody else, very, very conscious about, in terms of, of their relationships with the customer of being protective of, of privacy. That'll act as a sort of informal check, too. The big issue, though, is that the threat is growing, and we have no organized means of even sharing threat information. And I think that requires this step forward. Is it perfect? No. Will we make it better? We have to make it better. But we have been for several years now struggling to get something through it. In the meantime, the Sony hack, the, 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 the personnel records. And then the other issue, too, which you ask yourself is, at what point does America's, the privacy of individual Americans be totally co-opted because of lack of action by the government? Because commercial entities or hackers in a basement someplace or nation states can come in at will and take this information. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to strike the balance. And it's, it's like most of these issues, it's not an easy one. But I think the, 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 the bill itself it, it is, it is necessary because we're, we have to be able to begin to at least alert enterprises throughout the country when there's a persistent attack. And, and I'm told, again, you know, this might be, is that we are sometimes, through our uh, NSA, aware of uh, actions that are being taken, and we can't, they can't legally, because it's a military operation, tell a civilian entity you're being attacked. <laughs> You've got large institutions that are constantly being t attacked, and they can't, they're, they're concerned about liability. They can't turn around and tell, you know, the other entity that does the same line of work, you're, you know, we know you're getting it too. We hope we can do this in a way that protects the privacy. We have to do that. that and yes, sir, the final question. Thanks. You briefly alluded to sequestration. And uh, last week I was up in Seattle uh, interviewing defense contractors as part of a DOD grant. Uh, and in a number of cases, these were sole suppliers or close to sole suppliers of key elements of U.S. weapon systems. And they were really up against the wall, in some cases on the cusp of bankruptcy due to sequestration. And the concrete question is, how do you reconcile the needs of a global military with real materi material needs, with a private sector economy and a free market contracting system, in a system of increasing political dysfunction and stalemate in Washington? All of the above. <laughs> 
Now, that's the way you pass the SATs. I'll try it here. Uh, <laughs> I think sequestration, let's step back. Uh, in 2009 and 10, we were faced very seriously with the threat of default on our national debt because of the, 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 a new group of people that came in. Again, reflecting, as I said in my comments, this no government is better than any government, et cetera. And very, very sincerely, this, these are, this is not a, a pose they're putting on, very sincerely. And in that context, we passed a Budget Control Act, which said, okay, let's sit down, you know, 50-50, you know, six, six Republicans, six Democrats, and work out a, a budget plan that would encompass uh, reform of spending, talk, look at entitlements, and look at revenues, too. And it came to naught. And the big stumbling block, as I mentioned, this cultural, maybe momentary, but persistent impulse of no tax, no, we're not going to touch tax. So the, the, the choice was, well, let's take the, the BCA. So then roll forward. We're coming to the first year where it starts getting tight. Senator Murray, Paul Ryan, the new speaker, came together and had a, an extension. This year, I've got to tell you, I, I sense, I mean, I'm, that the problem this is creating, not just for our military, but for our contractors, for our communities, et cetera, and it was the one issue that separated my colleague and my chairman, John McCain, and I. I was one of about 20-some Democrats that voted against the National Defense Bill, which when you're the ranking Democrat on the committee is not done. And it was because we had to get out of the sequestration. And ultimately, through many factors, and my role was rather minor, frankly, there, there was a two-year sort of relief. And when the bill came up last week on the floor, we were able to pass it 92 to nothing because we're out of that now. But it hasn't left it. That's why I made this point in this comment. And if we're going to be serious about our long-term needs, and as we talked this evening, there are so many, you know, everywhere you look this, in this disordered world, there's so many different challenges. We're going to have to have the resource and capacity to meet them. And I'll go back to my theme again, and part of that is reconciling this culture of, you know, it's on and off, it's a two-year extension, it's because we can't, we can't turn around. If, looking at the highway bill, for example, this used to be the most non-controversial piece of legislation in the world, and everybody wants highway projects, but paying for it, one of the first ways to do it, because you can't, do it directly, as we did in the old days, it was to um, the federal re regional Federal Reserve Bank that pays dividends to the member banks. They better cut the dividend and move it over to the, okay, well, that'll get us a year and a half, but what, what do we do after that? So it's, it's not just in defense, it's in everything we do, and we've got to get through and break through. And uh, I think we will, I'm confident, but it's not gonna be a lot without, and I say this without, without a lot of agita. Agitator, a lot of agitator. So, thank you very much. Come sit down. Oh. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Senator Reed, for that uh, fantastic uh, talk. I mean, w the reason why this uh, lecture was so important is because one of the big debates that are going on in the academy but also in policy circles is uh, how to how to bridge the divide uh, and the divide is that we have these two different worlds the world of government of policy that has different kinds of time horizons different kinds of analyses etc and then the university system which has very different kinds of time horizons different kind of culture uh, etc and they were kind of talking past each other we're not working together so that the kind of work that we do here can inform uh, policy and the kinds of needs that we hear from the policy side uh, could uh, help and shape uh, the work that we do. And I think that this talk really showed uh, the great uh, challenges but also opportunities that we have to bridge that uh, divide. Your talk showed us how the kind of analysis 
uh, the subtlety of the analysis, the depth of the analysis, is something that we can learn from, and hopefully uh, over time uh, we can also uh, contribute. Uh, so um, I'm sure that I speak for everyone uh, in thanking you for your service, uh, for taking time out of your very busy schedule on a Sunday evening to come and uh, speak with us and deliver this wonderful lecture. And it reminded us all uh, how fortunate we are uh, here in Rhode Island and in the country to have you as a leader in Congress and a leader in the political situation in, uh, in this country. Thank you, Senator Reid. And let me also invite you all to a uh, reception uh, to uh, mingle and talk more about these important issues. Thanks.